Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for inviting me for this seminar. The title of my presentation will be Model-Based model AI for Future Communication Systems. So I will present uh, work in collaboration with uh, Taha and uh, Baptiste that are here, that are PhD students. And uh, it was done also with uh, Mathieu Fussier and uh, Philippe Denis from ETH. And we have uh, funding from uh, Mitsubishi Electronic Research Center Europe and from uh, So the talk is entitled Model-Based AI for Future Communication Systems. I will first introduce what I mean by future communication system. The context is the following. We consider large bandwidth multi-user multi-antenna systems, which is uh, summarized with the acronym MU-MIMO. It amounts to having a base station comprising a lot of antennas, so we will denote n the number of antennas at the base station that communicates with a lot of user equipment, so typically a smartphone, that are uh, that have only one antenna each. And between each UE and the base station, there is a channel. And in order to uh, optimize communication, knowing the knowing the channel is a key element. So, as a consequence, base stations constantly estimate channels. And this talk will focus on uh, the estimation and uh, exploitation of uh, communication channels. So, speaking of channels, the evolution of wireless communication systems entails an evolution of the, the, the communication channel. In uh, 4G, we had a few antennas at most uh, a dozen, and uh, pretty large bandwidth, so that the base station was able to focus the propagation towards the user with a quite large uh, beam. So the beam width is the, the width here. Next, for 5G, we can have a lot more antennas, up to uh, 64, for example, and a larger bandwidth. As a consequence, we have, we can aim at users much more precisely. And for 6G, the evolution is meant to continue. We will have possibly more than 100 antennas and an even larger bandwidth, so that we should be able to target very precisely the users with which we want to, to communicate. And actually, this has two consequences. So the, the first obvious consequence is that having more antennas and a larger bandwidth, which means more subcarriers, leads to channels with an increased dimension. So the dimension of channels is expected to increase a lot uh, for 6G. And this has two consequences. The first one is that, obviously, channels are more and more difficult to estimate. So the channel estimation problem is higher dimensional, so it will be more difficult to, to, to do, more complex. But on the bright side, we have also channels that contain more and more information, typically with very uh, narrow beams like that. Actually, estimating the channel will amount to almost estimate the, the user location. So knowing the channel amounts to knowing with a, a certain precision, but knowing the, the, the user location, which was much more difficult in front. So we have a drawback and an, and an advantage. And based on this, uh, these two facts, the objective of uh, my research here is to design advanced data processing methods to first estimate and then exploit channels in future communication systems. And what I mean by data processing is either signal processing or machine learning methods. Estimating is pretty self-explanatory, self but exploiting could mean localized user, optimize the, the preconing, detect anomalies, or estimate activity of, of the user. So we have a lot of possible um, applications, but each time we use advanced signal processing and machine learning methods. So this explains the future communication systems part. Now let's introduce the model-based AI part. 
So everything that we will uh, speak about today is based on the manifold hypothesis, which is the following. This is a setting that is very typical in data processing, which is that we observe a large number of variables, but actually these variables are very often correlated. And they are, in fact, explained by a pretty small number of independent factors. And so here is an example. If we have in 2D a point cloud like that, so which uh, are the, the, the axes here, they belong to a set to a space of dimension two, but they are close to a curve, and this curve is a, manif a manifold of dimension one. So actually here, even though we have an apparent dimension of two, we have an intrinsic dimension of one, so that if we uh, model accurately the, the manifold, we can expect this fact and reduce by a factor of two the complexity of a uh, processing problem. So this hypothesis applies to a lot of domains. So in image processing, or sounds, medical data, telecom signals, etc. And we will rely on this hypothesis to design advanced signal processing and machine learning methods. So the general approach to take into account the manifold is the following. So here we call the manifold hypothesis. And we have two concurrent approaches. The first one is the signal processing approach, which is based on models. So actually, very often it's an analytic description of the manifold. And having such a description allows to have, it can possibly have a large bias because actually the analytical uh, descriptions often rely on uh, simplifying hypothesis, simplifying ass assumption. But on the other hand, we have a low complexity because the model uh, is in general pretty low, low dimensional. On the other hand, we have machine learning methods that are database instead of model based and uh, which amounts to have a sampling of the manifold in order to, to assess uh, the, to, to treat the problem we want to treat. And here we have in general a low bias because these methods are uh, intrinsically adaptive to, the, to data. But as a counterpart, we will have a high complexity because we will need a lot of data to uh, calibrate the, the neural networks, for example, that we use. And uh, a lot of data and a lot of, com of uh, computation to train the models. And so the question we, we asked and we try to answer is the following Is it possible to achieve a trade off between signal processing methods and machine learning? And doing so would amount to come up with hybrid approaches, which is a so called model, by model based AI. And it amounts to use models. So that comes from signal processing to structure, initialize, and train machine learning methods. So we use the prior information that is contained in models, but we don't take it as granted, and we use it to initialize or structure machine learning methods. So we have a first step in signal processing, but we exploit signal processing models for machine learning. And it amounts to make models more flexible, to reduce their bias, and also it allows to guide machine learning methods to reduce their complexity, to, to, to suppress the, the drawbacks here. And for those who looked at the video that was with the announcement of the, of the seminar, we have the signal processing part, which is more aligned with the statistician approach, machine learning part with the data scientist approach, and we try to take the, the best of both worlds hoping for uh, good results. So here is the general approach. Now, I will speak about two examples. A first example about channel estimation and a second one about uh, channel exploitation. So the first one is about estimation and what we call resilient channel estimation. So here, the context is the same as before, a massive MIMO system. Uh, and we will denote H1, for example, for the channel of the first user. And in order to estimate channels, usually what is done is that the user send what is called the pilot signals, which is known at the base station, and which allows to sense the channel in order to estimate it. So, uh, and, uh, 
doing so, the base station will receive the matrix Q here. Every user will do it, and we will assume that the pilot signals are orthogonal, so that we don't have interference between the, the different uh, pilots. And doing so, and I will go quickly here, we can come up with channel estimates like that, which will be noisy. And the objective of our method would, would be to denoise this kind of channels using model-based model AI method. So, uh, yeah, the base station has noisy observations of the, of the channel. And we'll try to denoise. It's exactly what I just said, but it was on, on, this, on this slide. <laughs> and to do so, what can be done is to use a physical model. And a physical model, in that case, can be what is called a steering vector model, which relies on the knowledge of the antenna at the base station locations and gains. And if we know perfectly the antenna location and gains, we can, using a physical assumption of a plane wave propagation, we can describe the channel as actually a complex gain multiplying a, a string vector. And it's not important to understand the details of the model, but just that we can reduce a lot the channel estimation problem using the string vector model. And this allows to improve the signal to noise ratio with, um, if we have a lot of antennas, we can increase it a lot. For example, with 64 antenna, we can add uh, 18 dBs to the, to the SMR. The problem with this approach is that it requires to know exactly the gains and location of the antenna. And this is not real, realistic in practice, so that we will have model imperfection. And with this imperfection, how will this kind of methods behave? So we try to uh, assess this, um, this loss. And we see that, actually, the answer is that having uncertainty on locations and on gains can lead to a lot of, uh, of performance loss. Here we have in dB the performance loss. And we see that if we have a relatively high uncertainty on location, for example, we lose uh, almost 18 dB. And we could, with 64 antenna, gain at most 18 dB. So actually, using the models, with a large uncertainty is totally useless. So we would like to come up with a method that allows to correct the model's imperfection. So we would like to initialize a neural network with the model and hoping that training this neural network will allow to correct the model imperfection. So to do so, we propose the model-based neural network whose structure and initialization is based on the steering vector model. So without giving too much details, we have a specific structure here of the neural network, which is, which is reminiscent of autoencoder, but with a very specific structure for the encoder, which is based on an algorithm exploiting the, the steering vector model and a decoder that expresses also the steering vector model. And how we will initialize the model, the, the neural network in order to use the model is simply the weight matrix W here will be initialized with what, what we call the dictionary of string vectors. And uh, during training, we will allow the matrix W to deviate from the string vector models with which we initialize the, 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 the neural network. And so the data, it is an unsupervised method. So the data is simply a noisy channel. And the cost is simply like an autoencoder, the difference between input and output of the, of the neural network. So the advantages of MPNet is that it's unsupervised, can be trained online, and it's adaptive to the SNR. And the principle is the following. At initialization, this is a classic signal processing algorithm, namely the matching pursuit algorithm, which requires a model to be, to be used. And Training allows the model to adapt to data, meaning that W will deviate from a matrix of string vectors, so that if the model was imperfect, then we will allow 
here to adapt to data that correspond to the real physical uh, data that we that we collect. Uh, okay, so there's a bit of bibliography. And now the result that we can obtain with this kind of method is the following. So here, the, with the method which propose, we propose is the uh, blue triangle here. So I will describe what goes on here. We have in the cross here corresponds to using the algorithm at the initialization, so we, we, without any learning. The red here amounts to knowing exactly the physical locations and gains of the antenna. So this is a non-realistic assumption. In uh, and here it's also the, the orange uh, square corresponds to the initialization of the algorithm. So yeah, orange and cross are the same because it's they both correspond to the initialization actually. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that during training, so here it can be seen as a time axis. So it corresponds to the number of, of, channel, of channels that are seen that are collected by the base station. We see that at first, the neural network is as bad as the model, but then it can correct itself in order to almost attain what we would have knowing exactly the antenna location and gate. And here, at, the, at this time here, we introduce artificially uh, uh, an incident. So we, we broke uh, half of the antennas at the base station. And you see that doing so, the model that was originally perfect is not perfect anymore because we have the gains of the antenna that have been changed. So we have a drop in performance. Also with our model, that, with our neural network that learned the, the, the model. But then we can, put, by learning again, we can uh, decrease the error uh, also uh, after the, the, the incident. So just to summarize, we see that with the method we, we propose, we have a channel estimation algorithm that is resilient and that can adapt to changes in the, in the system thanks to um, an initialization that is based on signal processing, but that is used in a neural network setting. So this was the first example regarding uh, charge estimation. Now let's look at the second example regarding channel exploitation and more pre precisely efficient channel charting. So channel charting, what does it mean? It is a task in which the objective is to generate a chart that is consistent with the user's locations based only on their channel estimates. For example, it can be seen as an unsupervised related localization. But for example, if you have a base station that communicates with users, as always, and we have the base station that is here and the users that are here in the colored path, then what we would like to do is to collect the channels of the different users. And based only on that, try to, by channel charting, reconstruct a kind of map, which is totally unsupervised, so that we don't have an absolute localization of the user, but we'd like to uh, preserve the neighborhoods of the different uh, users. So that basically, the yellow stays with the yellow, the blue stays with the blue, etc. etc. So uh, channel charting has been proposed quite recently. And the one crucial step of channel charting is to find a distance measure that operates on channels and that reflects the proximity, the spatial proximity of users. So that's what we uh, try to do at first. We'd like to have a physics-based distance measure that uh, respects, that is consistent with the physical distance between corresponding users. So the first proposition, which is pretty naive, is to, to take simply the norm of the difference between the channels and to see that, to see if it respects neighborhoods. 
Actually, this is not at all the case because if you have users that are very far from the base station, their channels will have a very small norm so that they will appear very close because this quantity will be, will be very small, uh, even though they can be very far away. C and D here are very, are very far, but their, norm, their channel norms being very small, they will appear very close according to this distance. This distance will be very small. So uh, obviously, this choice is very bad because of what I just said. So another proposition would be simply to normalize the channels in order to get rid of this problem. So yeah, it works better, but we still have a very, uh, very important problem here because if in that case we use this distance measure and we have two users that are very close, that are separated by only half a wavelength. So if we have several, um, see the, if the carrier frequency is several gigahertz, it would be only a few centimeters. Then, if they are in the same that, that direction, a separation of lambda over two will lead to a distance of two, which is the maximum of this distance. So users that are a few centimeters away will appear maximally far away, which is, once again, very bad. So the third proposition that we came up with, and which is better, is the following. It amounts to using this distance, but is a global, global phase that totally cancelled the effect of uh, this uh, pathological case. And actually, computing this is easy because we don't have to, to solve the problem. We have a closed form expression for the optimum of this uh, optimization problem. So using this um, distance measure, we can perform, we can obtain a distance matrix between the distance matrix between all the users and then use a classical manifold learning method in order to reduce the dimension and to build the chart we want to do. For example, if you use a classical uh, manifold learning like uh, isomap, we can, if we have users that are in two uh, adjacent uh, streets like that, we can obtain um, a chart that, that would be uh, like that. So the results were pretty uh, good. We were happy with the we were happy with the with the results, but one big problem is that with this kind of method we cannot handle out of sample data. So we have a batch of that of data at the beginning. We can perform charting, but then if a new user comes in the scene and we collect its, its channel, it's not obvious to put a point for this user in the in a chart that has already been uh, computed. Mm -hmm. So in order to cancel this, uh, this drawback, what we propose then is to use, once again, a model-based neural network whose structure and in initialization are based on the phase insensitive distance measure that we propose. So the structure of the network is the following. So what it does is simply here for the first two steps, it computes the distance that I just introduced. Then it thresholds the results. So it keeps only the channels that are close to the current channel in terms of the, the distance. And then we perform a con convex combination of the chart locations of the corresponding channel. So just to say that we have, a, once again, a, a very specific neural network structure. It is not at all uh, an MLP or CNN, which is structured based on a physically motivated uh, distance measure. So the data that we will consider to train such a network would be channels as a way, but also the time at which the channels have been collected. It's called the timestamp, and it is something that the base station has access to without any uh, supervision by, by human. So it is an information that we have, so we might as well uh, use it. Now, how to train such a network and how to use the temporal information? To do so, 
we will make the assumption that for a given user, channels that are measured at close times correspond to close locations. So we make the hypothesis that the user does not move uh, at uh, infinite speed. It's a reasonable assumption. And based on that, we can know that uh, the channels that have been collected at close instance will correspond to close location. So here in green, for example, and those collected at, at uh, far away locations in time will correspond to far away location in space. Except if the users can, the user can come several times at the, the same place. But for now, we test it for uh, simple uh, trajectories. And doing so, we can, uh, in order to exploit this information, we can use a kind of a neural network training that is called the triplet loss, which is a kind of uh, contrastive um, learning and which amounts to have a loss that enforces the, the network to put channels close in time, close in short location, and uh, inversely, far in times, far in short location. So it amounts uh, the training to take a current sample, make it pass through the neural network to get, get the, the chart location, but also at the same time, taking a channel that, have, that has been collected close in time, and taking another ch channel that has, that has been collected far in time, and then we have three chart locations. And based on these three, three chart locations, we have a loss function that simply, sorry, called triplet loss because the loss function takes three outputs, triplet, and the loss that we would like to minimize is the following. So we would like to minimize this, so which amounts to minimize the distance between Z and Z plus, so closing time should be closed on the chart, and maximizing the distance between Z and Z minus, so uh, maximizing the distance, but have large distances for channels collected at distance uh, time instance. So here is the training that we use, and uh, the results that we obtain here for a slightly different configuration when we have only one user that that works on the, the color path here. And we get uh, results with which we are quite happy because all the colors are, uh, they, they are not mixed together and the, the order of colors is uh, preserved. And if we compare this with the classical neural network, we have uh, a bit uh, better results. So yeah, I, don't, I, I just show qualitative results, but. We have quantitative measures that uh, attest what I, what I just said. So yeah, that was it for the, the two examples. And now I can talk a bit about the ongoing and future work that we want to, to pursue. The first one regarding the estimation part, we would like to use uh, more complex models and more complex impairments uh, in order to be able to correct them. And we have one of the um, interesting candidates is the plane wave model. Because actually, if we have very large antenna rays, then wave fronts that are in intrinsically uh, spherical cannot be approximated by uh, planes anymore. So here on the, on the schematic, it's ob obvious because if we have a large here, the red is not close to the, the black, and we, if we have a small antenna red, it's close to that. So this, uh, since in for, for 6G, we, we will potentially have a very large antenna rays, uh, it would be interesting to be able to uh, correct uh, the, the defect of uh, the, the plane wave assumption. Another uh, potential, potentially interesting uh, work would be to use transformers, and especially in transformers, the, the attention mechanism for channel charting. Because if you were uh, very, very uh, if you looked very uh, precisely the, the, the previous slides, you could have noticed that one of the neural network we use for channel charting, actually the architecture we use, is very close to an attention head. 
because we compute correlations, then we do a kind of thresholding, which is also as what softmax does. And then we have a metric multiplication. So we have something very similar to this architecture, which is now very, very famous. And as a consequence, we could use all the, the know-how that has been gathered by uh, researchers using transformers to um, improve the, our, our result. A third a lead would be to use, uh, to consider channel estimation, but with new elements in the environment that are called reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. So this amounts to have not only a transmitter and a receiver, transmitter can have potentially a lot of antenna, but also in the, in the environments, the risks of our configurable engine surfaces, which is a kind of panel with passive reflecting elements that can be, whose uh, re reflection coefficients can be uh, tuned um, in order to optimize the, the transmission. And this, of course, increases a lot the dimension of channels. So that channel estimation is a really big challenge in that case. And it could be tackled with uh, the kind of methods that we uh, that I talked about uh, today. And for this, we have a PhD offer that uh, for, for this fall. So if some of you know potentially interested uh, students, then don't hesitate to tell them. Then we have also another lead, which is to learn the location to channel mapping using what is called implicit neural representation, which is again something that has gained uh, quite uh, success in the image processing and machine learning community. And here we could specialize the implicit neural representation to channel maps. Because actually, channel maps have, have a very specific uh, model, actually. They don't look at all like natural images, so that we could use a specific uh, uh, style of the channel images to tune the implicit neural representation neural architecture in order to to have good results uh, for, for this task. And actually, this is the, the PhD topic of Baptiste, uh, which is here. And finally, what could be done is to use channel charting as a compression method, because today I just spoke about channel charting uh, in itself. But a potentially interesting application of channel charting would be to use the channel chart as just a compressed representation of the channels, so that since it is very compressed, so the dimension uh, not, not more than 10, it could be exchanged between base stations so that uh, one base station could choose its precoder based only on the, the reduced, the compressed uh, channel that another base station would have sent to, to it. So what it is, it is the, the, the interest of doing so? Uh, simply, the second base station wouldn't have to estimate the channels. It, it should just take the compressed channel that would be estimated by another base station in order to choose this frequency. So potentially, we can, we could um, save a lot of uh, overhead by uh, implementing such, such an effort. So I think it uh, ends up my, uh, my talk. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, don't hesitate. So first one. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, so you say MPNet is unsupervised. Uh, what, what do you mean by this? So, so I don't think I'll type the information at all. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, the data that we use for training is simply the data that is collected by the base station. And we have really an autoencoder structure. So we have an input. And then the cost is simply comparing the input to the output. We don't have a, lab, a label to which we compare the output. We compare the output with the input. So that's, yeah. it's clearly the autoencoder setting. And, it's, it's and, and uh, just the next slide. Something I didn't get is, uh, it seems to me that you reach a better result by three years the optimal. So because the group curves goes under the red. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because the optimal is optimal before the incident. Okay, so it's it has the 
optimal model, it knows exactly the, the, the parameters of the system until the incident. And when we have the incident, the model that was originally optimal is not optimal anymore. And then if you compute a new optimal, would it be the continuity of the red one? Or uh, the same? Maybe a bit higher, actually, we didn't do that, but yes, maybe it would be, yeah, because since we would have less antennas, the denoising power of the base station would be lower, so that I guess that it would be a bit higher because here we lose antennas actually. We lose uh, yeah. some antennas. So 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 it, it would be higher, but I don't know how much higher it would be. Okay. I, I remember the question of Maxime. Yeah, here you, you don't uh, do again another estimation with the remaining antennas, or or you do. My point is, if uh, the, the, the estimation are done periodically anyway in, uh, in frame uh, pilots. Yes. So if you, you lose an antenna, let's say, mm -hmm. we do an estimation with three antennas instead of four. It works at how it works, but uh, there is another uh, pre-coding or decoding matrix uh, with uh, three uh, independent, uh, let's say, uh, uh, flows, you see. So if you, yes. if you reduce the estimation, uh, are you uh, are you at this level? I or? think it was an incident mm. that was not detected by the designer of the system. Okay. So so that it does like that exactly the same, not knowing that its model is not uh, the optimal anymore. Mm. It didn't change. If I'm not mistaken, that happened. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here. Can you go back on previous slide, please? So if I understood well, one of the strengths of the method you propose is that you initialize your model with uh, something so from the model, basically from the dictionary of a, of a, of a steering vector. So what if you initialize your model randomly? Is it really worse or? Yeah, we have experiments in this paper doing so. Actually, it, it begins much, much higher. Yes. And then it doesn't reach exactly the, the same level. Okay. Okay, interesting. Do you it, it, know why? Or uh, I, I think it, it, it reaches a, a worst local minimum. Yeah. This is the most simple explanation, but uh, it's quite likely. And did you play with the network, the architecture itself, with the, trying with the larger or smaller networks just to see if the, how it behaves? Yeah, 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 yeah. Plus, what I don't mention here is that we have actually. This network has a physical interpretation since each column here corresponds to estimate one path of a multipath channel. So that what we did is having uh, a depth of the network that is adaptive to the input. So at each X here, we don't have exactly the same architecture. We stop as soon as we have some uh, stopping criterion that is, uh, that is uh, met. Okay, so this is where also the initialization helps a lot because you already separated the, the, the model in separate channels. Yeah, yeah, it's the structure is more interpretable. It has less parameters, so it is more interpretable so that we can have an SNR adaptivity. It has less parameters so we can have online training. And it's, a, well, it's, it's an unsupervised, it is not related to the model, but uh, yeah. yeah. In which sense is it SNR adaptive? Because we implemented a, a variable depth. So for each input here, we estimate one pass. Then we have some residual. And for this residual, we compare its norm to the noise level. And as, as long as the norm of the residual is above the noise level, basically, it means that we have still signal in the in the residual so that we we have to estimate another path. And if the residual has a norm that is almost the noise level, it means that we don't have signal anymore or the signal we have is uh, below the noise level so that it doesn't make sense to estimate it because we have uh, too high variance. In that sense, it's, it's an adaptive because at each new X, the depths will not be the same. For, for X, which is a, a large SNR, we will go through much more layers than for the next with small SNR. 
And it makes sense to estimate more paths if we have uh, a powerful channel than if we have a, a very small channel. When you say online, strained online, no, what is exactly by that? Uh, because actually, we, we wanted to have an algorithm that could be trained while it is used. So at each step, we it can be used online because at the initialization, the performance is not that bad. If we initialized it totally independently, at, at the beginning, we would have a very, very high error and we couldn't use, uh, use it uh, in a system. But thanks to the clever initialization, we can do that uh, online. Plus, also, it can be turned online because the complexity of the backward propagation is much smaller than the complexity of the forward propagation. Because here we have uh, art social link operators that put uh, a lot of the, the activations to zero, so that when we do the backward propagation, uh, the complexity is divided by uh, a lot. So that estimating the channel, which corresponds to the forward propagation, has a complexity. But correcting the model, which corresponds to the backward propagation, has a complexity which is much smaller than estimating channels. So learning it costs much less than just estimating the channel. So that it's not a big overhead to introduce learning in, the, in this kind of estimation. Yeah, a comeback to the uh, to the SNR adaptive things, just to be sure to understand uh, when you say you if we have so if we have um, a stronger channel, you mean um, you need uh, more layers if you have stronger channel than weak channels? It means in terms of potentially uh, you can go through more layers, but, but if you have a very strong channel yes, that, is, you, that is made of only one path, a very strong loss, uh, loss component, okay, then you will be able because here it's, it's kind of a projection, projection onto the model. Mm -hmm. Then the, the, the norm of the projection will be very high and the residual will, will be very small. So, so that maybe we will stop after one iteration. Mm -hmm. yeah, ah, I, I don't know if uh, I yeah. did answer yeah, the, yes, the question. Yes, because uh, but it's yeah, the norm of the more, more residual than... that constitutes the norm of the original channel. At each step, we see how much channel, how much signal remains in the residual to be. And the SNR is, uh, is uh, I mean, uh, the, it is uh, the ratio between uh, the, the, the true model to the, the error, or, the, or you mean with the noise? Uh, noise level. Okay. It's just, actually, we just compare the norm of this to the noise level. Okay. And if the norm of this is smaller, or it's uh, on the order of the noise level, it means that the first iteration, Already accounted for most of the of the of the signal. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's classical in a matching pursuit or orthogonal okay. matching pursuit to have such greedy approaches where, if we know the noise level, we know how many iterations to to perform. But here, it's not how many iterations to perform because we have unfolded the algorithm. It is how many layers to go through. But it's counterintuitive in the sense that. Uh, perhaps no in machine pursuit, but I'm not very really familiar to that. Uh, but better the, the, the signal is, uh, most accurate is the estimation. So, yeah, the most accurate because you can, if you have a, a very strong channel, then it will have a lot of paths above the noise level. Mm -hmm. So, we can, we can estimate. Reliably, mm -hmm. a lot of pass. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And if it is weak, on the contrary, we will have uh, yeah, yeah. most of its yes. energy but that will be below the noise level, so that we can estimate reliably only uh, mm -hmm. its most powerful. Okay. But so this is why the complexity increased, but this is linked to the to the fact that the number the the, 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 the resolvability of the number of paths you can uh, you can have. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, using the same scheme 
uh, you can, I assume, uh, also take into account a small amount of pilot contamination in case uh, you have a smaller, you decrease the number of pilots. Yeah, yeah, actually, it was in the in the next uh, steps. We still didn't have time to to study this point, but uh, of course, we would like to to even include in the neural network structure the pilot matrix. But here we we, we stick with uh, orthogonal pilots. We assume that we don't have contamination, and we. We run the algorithm, but of course, uh, for the next steps, pilot contamination and uh, pilot matrix optimization could be included in the in the structure. Another question about the other example that you showed. Um, so maybe I missed something, but at the end, so you compare with the classical uh, neural network and. I didn't really get what the difference was. Is it the way you train the model where you assume that uh, uh, time is an indication of the location of the user and uh, it helps you to, to, to train the, I mean, it gives you a loss function basically uh, to train the network? And if this is the case, then how was the classical neural network trained? Actually, the classical neural network was trained exactly the same way, but with an MLP here. So with uh, a network that doesn't incorporate the physical information actually, which, which doesn't use it, which doesn't use the uh, model information. So it's exactly the same, but here we, you have an MLB classical with a three collective layer, etc. that is replicated three times, and that is trained with the same triple loss. So it uses also the temporal information, but with a structure that is uh, not tailored for the for the specific problem. And you mentioned that with the project method, the manifold uh, method, uh, there was an issue uh, when you tried to incorporate new data, but you didn't mention it again. I guess this is working better with uh, new data, not from. Uh, yeah, actually, we use such a fit forward structure in order to be able to 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 get rid of this uh, drawback. Because here, if we have a new H, we just input it to the network and, and it will output a uh, sharp location. Mm -hmm. And for, for uh, isomap, you cannot do that because isomap is a global algorithm that has to handle the whole data set in one go. So the generalizations work well. If, if I to take uh, a new data that is not on the path that was uh, selected by the user, uh, that is not directly on the path that was uh, yeah. worked by the user, will I get a point on the output that is relevant or? Yes, yeah, it depends how far from the training data you are, obviously, yeah. because the generalization capabilities are not infinite. But if you are not on the path, but uh, pretty close to it, it will, it should. <laughs> the point close to the, <laughs> and it, it does actually, because we, we when we separate uh, training and, uh, and test data, we have data that has not been seen uh, during the, the training. Assuming that the environment itself is not moving at all. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. significant uh, statistical overlap between the, the, the training and testing. Method. Did you try to change a bit the environment, assuming that you have like, cars or vehicles? That's uh, no, but actually, with the data set that we use, it was not possible, but they have made a new version in which we can include the cars, etc. But for now, it's not the top priority, but uh, it's at, it, it, it is an interesting generalization. And also to have an idea of what is the proportion of uh, environment element that change over which time scale in a typical environment. This is uh, crucial to the uh, proper working of this method because if it changes a lot and very fast, uh, it doesn't make sense to, to learn because as soon as you finish learning, or you, you would have to have very fast online learning to adapt uh, very fast to the changes. But for now, it's totally static. We have a few people connected online. If you have questions, you can just uh, ask them in the chat or open your microphone. So we have a first question. Can this triple plus idea somehow be combined with the recent ideas on forward training? Forward training, meaning uh, 
not using back propagation. I think this is something like that. Yes. Actually, I did, I'm not familiar with forward forward training, but since triplet loss is just uh, can be seen as a classical neural network that is replicated. It can be seen as a classical neural network with tied ways that are replicated three times. So if forward forward can work with classical MLP, I don't see why it could not, it could not work with the triplet loss. But once again, I, I, I'm not, uh, I did not study in depth the, the, the question, but it, it, it should. <laughs>